It looks like we have some people coming in, so let's roll. Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome, teachers and students. We're glad you've decided to join us virtually for this exciting event today with our friends from the Sotheby's Institute in New York City. My name is Darby Jones, and I oversee educational partnerships for EF Explore America. I am joined by my colleague, Sarah Shaven, who oversees loyalty and works closely with teachers from around the country. We are super excited to turn this over to Natasha and Bradley from the Sotheby's Institute as they facilitate this compelling webinar based on the intersection of art and activism. Um, as a quick intro, Bradley McCallum is a New York-based artist who addresses racial, racial identity and representation, collective history and individual responsibility. His work includes, <clears throat> excuse me, large-scale public projects, sculpture, paintings, photography, video, and self-portraiture. Natasha Becker is an independent curator of contemporary art based in New York. She has a passion for imagining new ways for audiences to connect with art, research and exhibitions, writing, collaborations, and curatorial programs. She is also an advisor to art collectors and art, arts organizations, a regular critic at international artists' residencies, and a mentor to emerging artists and curators. Welcome to the two of you. We're so glad to have you. Very quickly, um, quick reminder, although we can't see you, <clears throat> please submit any questions you might have into the Q&A feature during our time together. And Sarah will be keeping an eye on that in case we have time at the end, <clears throat> excuse me, to go through some of those questions. Um, right now, you'll wanna turn your screen onto speaker view so you can focus on who's speaking. And with that said, Natasha and Bradley, I will turn this over to you. So glad you're here. Um, thank you very much for having us, um, Natasha. It's been it's Natasha and I have had the honor to work together as artists and curator over a number of years, but this is our first time giving a talk together. So this is particularly exciting. Um, I want to give a special thanks to the Sotheby's Institute and to just share that. Um, I'm now in, I, looks, I believe it's my third year, um, or will be my third year of teaching, and I teach in the Summer Institute. And this summer we, um, like many other, had our, our plans um, shift and change because of, the, because of the pandemic. But being able to engage with students virtually and in this kind of a format is also really exciting. Natasha? Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Brooklyn, from Brooklyn, New York City, um, from Brad's studio, um, and where we also uh, work together. Um, I'm excited to be here, and I hope you enjoy the talk that we have planned for you um, around art and activism. So I am a curator, as Darby said, and um, as a curator, I work closely with artists and um, to understand their work and to also think about the kinds of contexts and um, ways in which um, larger audiences and people could understand their work and enjoy their work and experience art. Um, to me, activism is uh, you know, just very simply about um, countering ideas or practices that uh, favor some people and not others, um, countering and challenging discrimination of various kinds, and just creating a more equal uh, art and cultural environment um, that you know, is part of a struggle for a more e equal society. Uh, so in very simple terms, how, what that what that means um, as a curator and for artists, uh, for instance, or for art institutions and organizations and exhibitions, the ways in which we enjoy art. What what does that mean? Um, very simply, too, it means that you know when you go and see an exhibition, or when you encounter an artwork or an artist, or when you go to a museum. 
um, you know, what is it that you see? Who is it that you see? Um, what are the ideas or values that are being represented in that institution or in that exhibition? And how does that, you know, reflect um, certain issues that are important to, to us? Or, you know, whose culture do we see? Whose culture do we not see? Um, what, so you know, those sorts of yeah. questions. So, um, so I think, and, I'm, and, and thank you for sort of um, breaking that down because when you think about the word art and activism, it really is this intersectional space. It's about art that's trying to change. And for me anyways, as an artist and a practitioner, I can say that I've, I've, I, I can remember um, a question that was given to me in a seminar I took at in university uh, by an uh, art critic named Susie Gablick. And she asked the question, um, what is the role of the creative person in society? And that question was very broad and open-ended, but it began to imply a sense of responsibility. So for me as an artist, I don't only think about the work I make as objects or paintings or sculptures or collages, but I also think about the audience and how the audience might engage with that work and how I, as an artist, might be able to help shape and, and transform someone else's thinking. So for me, the activism comes from how I can make my work engage and shift and mm -hmm. alter the way people think. And I think you do the same thing in the exhibitions you curate. Yeah, as I was saying um, that as, you know, I was providing a definition of activism um, from a curatorial perspective. And of course, um, as Brad articulated, uh, artists have uh, mm -hmm. also very strong ideas about um, what are our responsibilities? And so the, there are those kinds of layers to when we talk about art and activism, you know, that an artist will have a strong idea of what that means. As a curator, I'm aware and conscious of what that means. Um, people writing about art as well also have particular ideas about that. And that's called art criticism, for instance. Mm -hmm. So we structured our presentation mm -hmm. so that I present some of the, a couple of the curatorial projects that I've done that I feel uh, exemplifies a commitment to, uh, to issues of equality and representation. And then Brad will talk about some of the artwork that he's done um, that also address core issues around representation and equality um, and inequality yeah. as well. So, and just to give you a sense of where we're speaking from. So we're speaking from my studio in Brooklyn, New York. Behind me are works that I made during uh, the, the spring and summer um, when we were all experiencing lockdown. And I worked with the materials I had at hand. I was getting the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. So I was going through those um, newspapers and clipping images and then creating vertical collages. And I'll show you some of those images. But I think what we'll do right now is shift and share our screen so you can see um, the um, slideshow that we have presented. And <clears throat> okay, so we'll st we, we're going to start with the project that I'm currently working on. It's called For Which It Stands. Um, please follow us on Instagram at For Which It Stands and visit the website. It's an evolving okay. curatorial project, which means that every week we feature a new artist, a new artwork. And um, For Which It Stands is inspired by artists who use the American flag. So for which it stands um, is a way of asking questions about what does the American flag stand for? What does it mean um, to different people? And um, how are artists using this iconic form of the flag and um, its symbolic content and the history uh, that is contained within it to create new flags and new cultural meanings? So I used a few big words there, iconic, symbolic, etc. And of course, American flag is a big word. 
because as soon as I say it, you all have an image in your minds of the American flag, and that's because it's so recognizable, um, it's so influential, and it's very famous um, because it's a representation of certain opinions and values. Um, some, symbolically, we are, we are referring to the stripes, which represent the 13 colonies, uh, former colonies. The stars represent the 50 states, and the colors are also symb symbolic. So red means, you know, valor, white means purity and innocence, and blue means vigilance, perseverance, and justice. Those are some of the meanings um, inherent in the American flag. So now everyone has an image in their minds of the American flag. And the artists that we are going to look at are using those symbols and uh, that image that we already have in our mind to talk about, you know, identity, to talk about um, issues, to talk about America, to talk about identity, to talk about like, immigration, to talk about um, uh, politics, uh, race, all the issues that are important to uh, artists as citizens today as well. Um, and, you know, we created this project because we saw so many artists who were using the flag in really interesting ways, and we wanted to showcase that. So our project, we have more than 35 artists, although we've only been featuring one or two artists a week since we started this on the 5th of October. Um, there are so much more that I can show you, and right now we are looking at an artist uh, by the name of Tasha Duje. Um, she's a Bronx-based artist. Uh, she lives and works in New York City. And what we are looking at is her justice flag. And the, her flag is made of um, um, hair that she's braided together. So, um, you know, extensions that you could buy, hair extensions that you could buy in a salon. And she's braided those together to form the stripes and then used cotton wool to form the stars. And so already her use of that material suggests to us that she's talking about a particular, um, uh, a particular group, a particular identity and certain sets of concerns that have to do with uh, black lives, right? Um, her flag is called Justice and she, uses her flag in a performance called the Pledge of Allegiance. And the Pledge of Allegiance is her way of going back to uh, childhood and being in school and having to say the Pledge of Allegiance and feeling disconnected from that. And, and so her performance is about, you know, all the questions she has about that. And she also then creates a new set of um, pledges, you know, that she mm -hmm. makes about things that are important to her, uh, like justice and um, like healing and, you know, um, the, the sorts of themes that for her are really important uh, as a way to engage today. Um, the next artist is Taj Rast and following Taj is Tariku Shaferu, and I mentioned them together because we had a talk in which both artists discussed their works. And the title of Taj's flag is Nation, and then in brackets, hyphenation. Um, and his flag, he drew inspiration from various kinds of skin tones. You could see that the, the colors in the flag go from light uh, on the left to dark on the right, and the stars uh, have been replaced with these black stars. And in Tariku's flag, uh, he's, the, the title of his flag is Tears, spelled T-E-A-R-Z, and then in brackets, Wu Tang, uh, because the inspiration for his flag comes from uh, hip hop music, r and um, rap, jazz, etc. And both artists, are recreating the flag in colors that speak to black culture and, uh, you know, kind of represent um, just how rich and how colorful uh, the flag would be with uh, the voices of uh, black artists and, and black folk in general. <clears throat> June Edmonds is another artist that we recently featured in the project. Um, she's based in LA and 
she creates these incredibly beautiful paintings um, that you can see behind her. And they're really large. You can see in, in, in scale when you compare the painting to her body, they're really large paintings. And they're very, you know, meticulous and repetitive and meditative and precise, the, the way she creates those uh, brush strokes and those lines. And her flags were inspired by historical events around flags and contemporary events. So for instance, um, she has a flag, um, it's not pictured, it's not, uh, in, it's not pictured in the slide, but one of the flags she created, for instance, was called Silence. And you can see that on her website and on the gallery's website because it's up in an exhibition right now. And she created this flag after the death of Breonna Taylor. And Silence was a way for her, uh, she uses this title because she was just so shocked by, she'd you know, go to school and she, where she teaches or be in other social settings and people would carry on as if, you know, nothing's sort of wrong, everything's just fine and going about their day-to-day -day business. And, you know, she just felt that the silence is so deafening around the death of Brianna Taylor that she then created a work that kind of represented some of these feelings um, as well as you know making a statement about how having a national conversation about this is important more important than the silence um, that is around it and as you all know there has been a huge outcry and protests around uh, the deaths and, and killings of Black people by police. Um, in a lot of uh, June's paintings, you can see in the colors um, and the replacement of the stars and stripes with this more, much more nuanced, much more, uh, you know, rich, uh, complex colors um, and trying to bring that into the conversation, you know, that it's not just red and blue and white. It, it's much more complicated than that. Um, the next artist is Dapo Rio and I'm going through this quite quickly because, you know, we have a lot to get through. But again, I encourage you to uh, check this out after class and, and you'll find out more about these artists. And Dapo Rio is an artist who um, was originally from Nigeria, uh, moved to the United States in the 80s and um, lives also in Brooklyn, New York. And a lot of his work deals with that immigrant experience. And as you can see, a lot of these works make you think about collage because they are bringing all different elements together, whether it's painting, whether it's fabric, um, whether it's, you know, everyday materials uh, or, or beauty, yeah. beauty materials. And, and I know Dapo's work well, um, and I love this piece in particular because you can imagine uh, that this flag will fold up into the suitcase and you can carry that with you. So the the way the flag is framed by the suitcase that is sort of, by, it's sort of tied to it. It's stitched, stitched into the base of the, 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 the foundation of the suitcase. You begin to realize that this is speaking about this kind of blending of histories and pattern and people and the stripes. And in the stars, you'll notice that the stars, you know, it's not only the 50 stars in the traditional flag, but the, the number of stars have increased, right? Uh, to represent the sort of, you know, increase in, in the sort of groups yeah. that have immigrated and who do love you, right? And what I, what I want to say just um, about all these artists so far is also that, you know, the engagement with the flag is a very positive one. It's not a negative one. It's not about, um, you know, criticizing um, in a negative way, it's, it's actually a very positive, mm -hmm. additive um, engagement with the American flag um, in saying, you know, let's, let's sort of expand this, let's, you know, this is about include inclusion, and this is about participation, and this is about bringing the best that we have to who we think of ourselves as Americans, who we want to be as Americans, and the values that, you know, we, we hold dear and that we share. And um, the last work in this project um, that, I, that I'll show is 
by Bradley McCallum, who's right here. And uh, <laughs> these are um, paintings that Brad made a few years ago when he was looking at um, the war, the, the US involvement in overseas wars, so in the Middle East, et cetera, and reactions you know, to the US presence in Libya or in Iraq, et cetera. And, also using newspapers and um, news media coverage of the wars and seeing all these images of um, American flags being burned, you know, on, on foreign soil. And I think mm. thinking about, you know, what is, what is our image in the world, mm -hmm. right? And what is our role in the world? And, you know, um, just uh, questioning why is this um, happening? And so these are paintings that are based on images, but you know, you'll see that there's the sort of blurry, blurriness to them. And that's because the painting is covered by a layer of silk, which has another image. And that creates this um, filter because- Well, I think, what, I think, I think the silk overlay actually, it shifts the way that, your experience of the work is in terms of time because you have images on two layers so that as you move the um, the alignment between the two images shifts and there's a quality of a kind of beauty that happens with the fragility of the silk surface so you're drawn to what is really a tough image but you are drawn into it through its beauty and the seductiveness and I think um, this might be a good way of of shifting and talking about the current project because it is interesting that this was inspired by found images and newspaper images. And so similar to the work behind, the, the body of work of light is what I'm working on right now. And I will share with you just a couple of images and these are individual collages. So they're, um, you know, 18, 20 inches by 24 inches. And they are my clipping of images and then rearranging them based on an intuitive and associative way of connecting images. So from this broken glass reflection of someone to the skulls, to these empty spaces that doctors and nurses and first responders were working on to the casket that becomes a visual narrative that's associative. And as I was working on this body of work, that's this sort of concurrent with that is when George Floyd was killed and the nation protest um, uh, came forward, not just in Minneapolis, but throughout the country. And what I think is a really um, profound manner. So these individual collages then become part of a larger um, um, body of work, a, a, a vertical column, which you see behind, which you see, what you saw behind us before. And I'm going to shift here and just show you. Oops, stop share. One second, a little technical difficulty. <clears throat> um, and I'm going to try to share a different screen here. So that same collage materials is um, last night was the first night for this video projection to be shown at in Buffalo, New York. Um, uh, and it's being projected on the front facade of the Birchfield Penny Art Center as a very slow reflection on what, um, of this shared recent history that we have all moved through. And for me, this body of work is both a requiem, a, a way of reflecting back and remembering, but also will become an important archive moving forward and thinking about the ways in which um, uh, 
we are tied together and to be thinking about the underlying politics that are informing this pandemic. But at, so as a curator, I will jump in and say, <clears throat> okay, please. you know, when I'm visiting an artist and I'm learning about this kind of work, I also think about, well, what does this mean for the for, for the rest of us? You know, what does this mean for the broader society? What does this mean for us as, you know, art visitors and viewers, etc.? And I think that one of the things that stand out for me is that, you know, the media goes through these cycles, right, where they'll be hyper-focused on uh, one issue or one event or, you know, mm -hmm. like COVID, where we just for months, you know, from on the news media, on television, as well as in newspapers, was just so much information and so much images and so much data. And, you know, it was so overwhelming and also anxiety provoking. Mm -hmm. And I think that now we've seen mm -hmm. um, the media's kind of pivoting again to the presidential election and covering the current president. And so there are less of these kinds of images and reports and visual stories. And so for me, that is important because through this process, Brad has kind of slowed down the last six months um, and allowed us to actually have a moment of just reflecting on that and just processing that and just you know kind of calming it's, it's a very calming um video to watch and it's also very moving and so i think that it really um also gives us gives us something mm -hmm. you know when we're coming to this and we're yeah. looking at it, it it also gives the viewer and the and the audience something to see process digest understand ask questions about too perhaps and um, and mm. as as well as making us think critically about yeah. what the media focuses attention on, but maybe there are things that demand uh, a longer, you know, and a slower mm. process of attention. Yeah, that's you know, thank you for that. So, mm -hmm. um, and I I I guess I will as I sh begin to shift to talk about two other projects. Um, I just want to also acknowledge that part of the way the media was able to communicate and talk about something that was really beyond scale and measure was through images in a way that I've never seen newspapers do to quite the extent that they did. So this hopefully will capture some of that. And I'm gonna stop and then share a different screen again. I go back to All right, and we're gonna play. So <clears throat> um, the collage works um, dovetailed into not only talking about COVID and the pandemic and the impact, but it also talked about um, uh, Black Lives Matter. And so that made me in turn wanna talk about this earlier body of work called Witness Perspectives on Police Violence that I did in 1989. And it's a series of public artworks um, that were installed on the streets throughout New York City at locations where incidences of police misconduct or police violence took place, including um, moments of, 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 of police, of, of violence to police. So it was incorporating the testimony from police officers as well as victims and um, surviving family members of police related shootings and incidences. And it was really asking the question, what does it mean to police a democracy? And so this, these emergency call boxes were transformed into a testimonial, um, uh, a, a way of listening to testimony from individuals who have been personally impacted. And that, that sound, um, was very soft spoken and it wasn't about a loud amplification, but it was about inviting people in to listen. So what are people listening to they've had and what are those little lights that are coming out of those boxes? Great question. So the images are locations throughout New York where incidences of police violence have taken place. And what you listen to when you stand next to a call box is the testimony of whether it's a youth, 
a parent, family member, or a police officer, all individuals who have had personal impact and experience with police violence. This is in front of the um, 81th precinct in Brooklyn where Abner Louima was sodomized, for instance. And this is in front of the home of Amadou Diallo's home. Amadou Diallo is a, was a young man who was shot 41 times. And this, this work moved from the location where the incident took place to the place that ultimately uh, determined some level of accountability. In and are that those case. moving images on the inside? In this, no, they're, they're actually still, still images? images, yeah. Okay. Another work I wanna share with everybody is a, a work called Evidence of Things Not Seen. And it's a work of 104 painted portraits of the Montgomery bus boycott protesters. This is in this first installation is in a historic home in um, um, New Orleans, and it was part of Prospect One. And so we took over the entire ground floor of this museum, painted the walls, brought in chandeliers, really made the experience of that um, historic home as a way of paying tribute to the protesters who really are acknowledged as one of the seminal moments of the civil rights movement. And Montgomery bus boycotts, yeah, the Mont Mont Montgomery bus boycotts. This is Dr. Martin Luther King. This is uh, a painting that's made from the mugshot um, of his being arrested. And this is actually the first time that Dr. King was arrested during a protest. And so it was really a seminal moment when uh, individuals step forward. And you can see in this, this woman's expression that there's a sense of pride and a pride. She's holding the arrest number, but there is a, a point of intention in the portraits and the subject's engagement in this. So this gives you a bit of a sense of this body of work. And for me, it's also an interesting body of work to look at because um, in terms of our conversation, because um, Natasha ended up including that work in an exhibition that she curated at the Ford um, at, at the Ford uh, Foundation, Foundation Gallery. This body of the work right now, I should say, is installed at the Legacy Museum, um, and this is the work is currently on view uh, for the public. Uh, in Montgomery. So it's the first time that this body of portraits have in essence returned home and is um, part of a much uh, larger museum that's doing an extraordinary job. If you ever have a chance to go to Montgomery, I definitely would seek out the Legacy Museum as well as the National Memorial to Lynching Victims, which is run by the same organization. So I, I included this work in an exhibition that was titled um, Radical Love at the Ford Foundation Gallery. The Ford Foundation is um, an organization that supports social justice in the world. And they opened a gallery last year to also support artists who are working for social justice. And I included this work because um, I think making visible um, you know, the everyday, everyday actions or the, let's say the heroic actions of everyday people is um, also an activist um, practice to unearth uh, these hidden histories, um, but also sometimes, you know, just to honor people who are often vilified. We've seen today that protesters have been vilified as, you know, being destructive and um, destroying property and, you know, um, uh, unlawful, etc. But this work provides us with also a kind of historical context for understanding why people protest and um, the forms that protests can take. This was a peaceful protest, for instance, um, as were many of the protests uh, around Black Lives Matter. So, you know, just to talk a little bit about the act activism of the work in the context of an exhibition that was really about um, 
how acts of love, uh, love for one's community, love for one's country, love for uh, certain values, um, certain beliefs can inspire social change. This, so what are we looking at here? These are just, these are more views of the exhibition. As you can see, it was called Radical Love. And so we surrounded the gallery in the color of love, um, passion and, you know, honor and all those symbolic um, meanings to the color red, but also how red makes us feel. Mm -hmm. So everyone felt very uplifted and joyful and celebratory. And we were celebrating, you know, we, we were celebrating acts of love by artists um, that are about, you know, changing things for the better, you know, changing the situation for themselves, for their communities, for their families, just, you know, work that is really about addressing the problems that we are facing and calling attention to those, but also highlighting the ways in which we have overcome problems in the past, uh, as well as currently. And so, as you can see, the exhibition is very rich and beautiful um, and, and creating a, uh, this context of beauty and joy and love um, for, for social action, right? Um, I, I think you could maybe um speak a little bit in terms of how unique it is for the Ford Foundation, which is um, a foundation that is about grant giving and giving money to a whole range of different organizations, how unique it is for them to do, to have a gallery space in the first place. And you were, you were part of the initial curatorial team working with the Ford Foundation. I believe this was the second exhibition they ever did. Can you talk about what it meant to do to create an exhibition within the context of a foundation that normally gives um, grant money to social justice organizations? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the sig the significance is that art was included into you know, and, and the foundation does uh, support the arts. That is one of the areas in which the foundation provides grants and gives support. And so uh, the foundation is a grant making foundation. That means that they, you know, through giving money to different organizations and um, initiatives, they support uh, those initiatives that are about making the world a better place in a global context. So to have a, a gallery dedicated to artists who are also doing that mm -hmm. through their artwork is a fusion of those missions, you know, right. and also includes artists in that work of creating change. And that change can take many forms, you know, it can be about critical thinking, you know, how artists and art works when we look at it makes us ask, you know, what is this? What am I looking at? Why is the artist doing this? What, you know, Mm -hmm. what, what is the significance yeah. of this? That is a process of critical thinking. How work can make you feel? Does it make you feel angry? Does it make you feel upset, uncomfortable, um, exuberant, joyful? You know, is how work can make us feel is also a way in which artists can try to engage us and tap into, you know, either our heads or our hearts um, to really uh, look at what right. it is that artists or mm -hmm. artworks are trying to say mm -hmm. or what are the questions that they're trying to ask and how do we feel about that you know and i i have all i believe that you know all we need to really enjoy art and understand art um is curiosity you know uh we 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 only need to be curious about what are we looking at um what the artist mm -hmm. is using and doing um, and, you know, and how we feel about that and kind of come to our own conclusions about that. And artists know that, you know, people can come to artwork with many different ideas and feelings mm -hmm. and experiences, mm -hmm. but they can also take away many different things. So it was, it was just, it was important to have those two things in, in alignment, you yeah. know, artists working to make the world a better place in a 
organization and a setting that is also dedicated to that same purpose. And obviously mm. as a curator, to be able to bring the two together yeah. and really provide an experience for people in which they felt that, you know, um, we, there, there are people who are looking out for each other. Well, I have to thank you because the work would not be included in the current installation in Montgomery if it was not for the fact that it was at the Ford Foundation. So when it was installed at the Ford Foundation, this is evidence of things not seen, the grouping of 104 portraits of the Montgomery bus boycott workers. Um, Brian Stevenson, who is the founder of that organization, um, had a chance to see the work. And sort of at the same time, I had the chance to be able to visit and look at and go to the museum. And I felt this would be the perfect place for this body of work. So I emailed Brian Stevenson and said, you know, this is a body of work. I introduced it. And he said, wrote back almost right away and said, you won't believe this, but um, I had a chance to see this, this exhibition at the Ford Foundation. And I've been waking up at the wee hours in the morning thinking, how can I bring this to Montgomery? So as an artist, when we present work out in the world, we, um, we, it's, sort of, it's, it's sort of like making a gift. You, you put that work forward, you, you do it with the hope of, I do it, I can say for sure, with the hope of changing the way people think mm -hmm. and how they feel and about changing their values and impacting. And so for the fact that I was able to reach out to Brian Stevenson, who's an extraordinary leader and someone, whoever's uh, listening to this, take his name down, Google him. He's quite, um, he's done incredible work around um, prison reform and fighting for those who have really not been well represented. But for him to be able to say, I've seen this work, I want to bring it back to Montgomery for the fact that it is in Montgomery right now. And that some of the descendants of those individuals whose portraits I painted have now had a chance to see uh, my treatment of their ancestors is really extraordinary. And it, it is about the cycle of giving. So um, I think for me, when I begin looking at how will I take the work that's active in the studio right now and share it with the public. It's about trying to think about how can I share um, my work in a way that will make, will give people the space to reflect more deeply on this process of shared loss that we've all, that we're all experiencing now. And, and there's, there's a way of trying to find both museums and institutions to show the work, but also trying to find um, not being defined by that in, in and of itself, but finding ways of showing that as temporary installations on the street as well. So this might be a great time to um, see if there's any questions out there. And then also to be able to share some core um, ideas that we have in terms of, of um, practice. Um, I wish this was a, a moment where we could uh, all see everybody in the audience, but, um, but so, let's see if there's yeah, any questions. Let's, let's take some <clears throat> questions. I think we've presented, obviously, again, a selection of Brad's work, a selection of my work. Um, maybe when you heard art and activism, you thought also of, you know, different forms of art and different ways of um, um, thinking about it. So, you know, I, th I think it's important to say that, that this is one slice of a broad practice of art and activism uh, that we've presented. And so we welcome questions and we'd be happy to point you toward, you know, um, resources as well. Um, so it's always hard to be the first person to ask a question, but I uh, encourage you to. Yes, put, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. But in the meantime, I did have a question that came from a teacher who, uh, prior to the session, who in your good segue, you had just mentioned there's um, many other forms of art and activism. And she had asked specifically about combining um, 
art and activism around natural sciences and environmentalism and was curious if you had either resources that could help them explore that uh, those types of you know um, works or if you had experience working on things like that in the past. A great, <clears throat> a great question. Um, there is one artist who is one of my mentors and someone who inspired me is whose name is Meryl Latterman Eucles. And she has been the artist in residence with the New York Sanitation Department now for over 30 years. But her work is quite extraordinary in how it makes us look at and think about our impact on the environment. And that's just one example, but you've also been working on exhibitions around the environment. Yeah, I um, earlier this year curated an exhibition that was called A Perfect Storm. It was at Faction Art Projects. Um, I, I can't see my chat back box, otherwise I, I would actually type this in for some reason. But um, the exhibition was called The Perfect Storm and it was at uh, Faction Art Projects in Harlem. And I brought together about six or seven artists who were all dealing with environmental issues. Um, and from a, a range of different perspectives. So Tatiana Arocha is a Colombian born artist who lives in, in New York City. And she deals, a lot of her work deals with the Colombian jungle um, and the extraction of resources, but also with uh, care, you know, how do we care for each other and care for the environment uh, through different practices that she's developed, like, you know, collecting uh, plants and, and sticks and different kinds of things and using those as materials, you know, paintbrushes and uh, stamps to make her work. So I would encourage <coughs> you to take a look at Tatiana Rocha's work. Lionel Cruet is a Puerto Rican born artist who lives in the Bronx in New York City too. And he, I showed some of his works that address the impact of the hurricanes on Puerto Rico and um, the environmental damages. And he looked at it from the perspective of a lot of environmental agencies and relief agencies who show up during these times and who actually end up leaving a lot of um, plastic behind and so you know his work he used some of these tops these blue tops um, and created these paintings with these scenes you know these beautiful sort of island scenes of palm trees and uh, homes and houses but also very dark and omnia so he's using this very material that was left behind to, to make art out of that so there were a number of artists in that show and I, I would be happy to um, uh, share that with uh, Sarah uh, and she could share it with the group um, at a later point. I, I mean, I, I do think that it's um, important to acknowledge the moment we're in right now. We're just less than a week away from an election and that election is um, going to change the way in which we address, we address environmental, environmental concerns. concerns. And yeah. also I think it touches almost every aspect of politics the reason why I want to focus on this for a moment is that one of my concerns is that there is, depending on where you live and what news you listen to, you can be in your own silo. You can only hear voices that affirm your point of view. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the, the biggest challenges we face as a, as a, as a, um, says, you know, a broader citizen body to be able to think outside of our own point of view and to be able to engage with another's political perspective, another idea, and to open up a level of conversation and dialogue. That has been, we've gotten to the point where we're so polarized, it's really difficult to be listening to anybody but those people who support your own values. And I think you know, art may be a, a, an effective tool to engage civic dialogue, to break out of this polarized environment, to get people to talk to each other across um, their bias. Yeah, and I think a lot of the work that we've looked at now and thinking about collage as a practice too, um, you know, artists are drawing on different 
resources and different sources yeah. to create a work that we see as finished and complete and whole and beautiful, but is actually made up of complex layers and different parts. And I think, you know, we that could be a metaphor also for how we overcome our divides, which is, you know, to take a little bit of everything and um, and to see that that when that's combined, when our concerns or care for the environment, for instance, um, you know, might differ depending on where we live, um, what our state, you know, class status is, mm -hmm. like where we work, um, mm -hmm. how much money we make, uh, etc. Like, you know, when you put all of that together, what I think you have is a richer picture of the situation, yeah. you know. I mean, I, I think about the body of work I shared with you, Witness Perspectives on Police Violence. The experience of that work when you encountered it as on the street, there was no big sign saying Black Lives Matter or stop police brutality. There was nothing political about its presentation, <clears throat> about its presentation. What it did is it took objects that are historically significant in New York City, these emergency call boxes, the the cast iron objects and repositioning them and taking something that is familiar, but, but out of context. And it did so in a way that tried to draw the broad spectrum of the public in to listen so that they would find themselves being really close to the call boxes, leaning in, listening to discover what was being shared. There was a and an intention to include the testimony of police officers as well as people who were victims. There was this attempt to try to create a civic space around that work that didn't just speak to the political left, but also a much broader body of work. And I think when you think about art and activism, thinking about how do you, as an artist, how do I create work that not only speaks to people who have shared values, but how do I engage with people whose values are different? Mm -hmm. How do we create this common space of understanding, of listening, of reflection? Um, and I think through that, we all discover something um, that share that speaks about our shared humanity and our shared connections. And I think um, that, I guess, it's that value system that informs why I've stayed true to this commitment to mm -hmm. making art that is also about activism. Mm -hmm. That's also about trying to speak to the ideas that inform our society. Yeah. And, you know, one of the most amazing experiences <laughs> that I've had as a curator creating exhibitions um, that address certain topics such as the environment or you know, social justice is in the instance of the Ford Foundation gallery exhibitions, there were more than 800 to 1000 people at those openings um, for the two shows that I uh, co-curated there. And that is extraordinary because, um, you know, people were lining up around the block and, um, to, just to get in and experience the opening, which was free to the public. And, uh, you know, it was sort of like a little bit of a mob scene, you know, because there were just so many people. And usually openings are more festive and there are lots more people, you know, and so that's uh, normal. But the numbers of people who went, who came out um, on those nights and then consistently over the run of the exhibition, you know, 100 people a day or, you know, another few hundred a week, et cetera. That really um, blew my mind because that meant to me that all those people, you know, 8,000 at the end of the day, 5,000 after the run of the show, 6,000, all those people got to engage with those ideas and were artworks, um, but also got to, you know, see this work that I had also had a part in, in creating. And, um, and what well, I took of, away, sort of like, what I took away from yeah. all these visitors was that even if people had, you know, were coming from different walks of life or had different political views, um, you know, uh, that uh, they felt they were in a in a space that was about, 
you know, that was welcoming and inclusive and where they belonged, even if they had different ideas. Yeah. And I think that as a curator, it's important for me that I create spaces like that for people that, you know, you can disagree, you can have different points of view, but you, because you belong to that mm. space, you belong to the space, you belong to the society, you belong to this democracy, you know, you do have a voice in that. And, and creating spaces where we belong um, is, you know, it's part of what a curator does is, is to create spaces yeah. where people feel that belonging through artwork and working with artists who mm -hmm. similarly want to have, you know, and participate in spaces where people feel they belong, um, but also that they can have a say. So we only have a few minutes left. So I think this might be a good point to transition if there's not a, another question that's pending, just for us to share maybe some ideas for you to take with you when you go into the studio and begin making work. So I know that many of you who are, are watching this live or will be watching the recording of this will also be making artwork yourselves. And there are, um, so my, my advice to you is that when you begin working with collage, you begin by pulling together pieces bits and pieces that mean something that have uh, for you um, represent a fragment of a story and that the way you place those um, fragments on top of each other alongside of each other um, in relationship to each other becomes your own haiku it becomes your own story it becomes your own way of being able to um, knit together um, different ideas so that, that your expression becomes the sum total of the parts. And I would encourage you to think about the, the, the politics of now and think about the, um, your own place in relationship to the larger issues that we're all facing and to take the challenge of trying to claim your voice within that. Um, do you have any tips for? Don't worry about things getting messy. <laughs> <laughs> Great advice. Great yeah. advice. So we're just about up to, we have got two minutes. Is there any other pressing question? Uh, before, I, I was before. just going to add one Sorry. more. Um, some ideas, <laughs> you know, from just this talk for creating your own collage could be um, you know, creating your own flag, thinking about what your flag would look like and what kinds of issues you want to express and what kind of story you want to tell. Um, and as you can see, you can use a range of material, anything goes, um, as long as it's a material that speaks to you. Um, mm -hmm. And then newspapers, magazines, those are all the usual things for collage. But as you've seen, you can use cotton wool, you can use, you know, wool, you hair. can use hair, <laughs> you can use fabric, you can use so many things in your collage, um, whatever speaks to you. And I uh, hope you have fun with that. Awesome. Yeah, before, before I flip this back to Sarah, we just had one comment come through and this was about the Radical Love Show. Um, the comment was, it's inspiring seeing compelling work from different artists in New York and outside of New York that are calling attention to problems and the, this notion of how do we overcome. Um, but you guys, this was fantastic. I think it was wonderful for all of us to see the, the intentionality behind when you're, when you're curating something, what that entails and what that means. And Bradley, the work is beautiful. Um, really really interesting and inspiring i think for for all of us and we're just so grateful that you've taken the time to chat with us today and connect now with you know teachers and students around the country it is just fantastic um and sarah any, any final thoughts yeah I was just gonna say, so we have no other questions, but I do appreciate you guys. Um, just as Darby said, this was so thoughtful and deliberate and um, you know emotional, and it's really great to see the work that you guys are doing. And we're so appreciative of your sharing that with us. And we know the students and teachers will be really excited to hear from you guys and then take their learnings and hopefully, you know, take that onto the classroom and see what happens from there. So we're very, very appreciative. Thank you. And I just. For, for the students out there who are 
making your way through this very difficult year. You know, my heart goes out to you. I have a, a 17 year old who is experiencing his senior year at high school in our house working remotely. And I just know that it's, it's a big challenge for everybody. And, you know, hopefully by next summer, we will have come through the darkest of these days and um, there will be some level of normalcy back again. And I encourage you to really look out at the offerings that the Sotheby's Institute um, will be putting forward for next summer because it, it is an extraordinary opportunity to be working with kids from around the nation and even internationally to um, come together, forge a community and experience art in depth uh, from one of the great resources, New York City. So depending on what faculty you work with, you'll be doing deep dives into museum collections and also doing studio work. So it's quite exciting. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Darby. Thank us. you, Sarah. Thank you, for Thank you everybody. Thank you, guys. Oh. And for everybody that's, that's on the call, if you'll um, just hang tight. Once we end our time together, a survey will pop up. So if for everybody at home, you can just take a moment to answer those questions. That'd be great. But thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And uh, we'll be in thank touch very soon. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.